Friends, there is a never-ending controversy on who brought freedom for our country, India. The answer is, however, very simple and well known to us. The freedom fighters. Yes, in other words, for those who fought for our freedom and at the same time, not for those who begged for our freedom being in a safe zone. In an extreme situation from the battlefield in Burma in 1945, when Netaji Subhas Chandra Bose decided to retreat, the freedom fighter Janaki Dawar, captain of the Rani of Jhansi regiment, denied. She was ready to fight till death. Netaji was so pleased about her courage and responsibility that he presented her a gift later. Friends, do you want to know what was that gift? What courage she demonstrated? And how were those days? We will come to know from an article I am going to narrate today. Hello friends, I am Samridhi Banaji and welcome to my channel The Mad Reader. Today I am going to narrate the stunning story of Janaki Dawar, an article named A Rani on Horseback, written by Nilanjana Sengupta, published in Netaji Subhas Chandra Bose, The Singapore Saga, and courtesy Netaji Research Bureau. So let's start. A Rani on Horseback Conversations with Datin Janaki Athi Nahappan Captain Janaki's still vivid memories bring her days in the Rani of Jhansi Regiment to life. An interview by Nilanjana Sengupta Datin Janaki Athi Nahappan still fondly called Captain Janaki by her old acquaintances, lives not far away from the steel and glass spires of the Petronas Towers. Yet the flow of contemporary life seems to have left her house largely untouched. The Datin at 86 lives her life surrounded by Netaji memorabilia, an old portrait of Netaji flanked by A.C. Chatterjee, M.Z. Kiani and Habibur Rahman stands with her family photographs. A glass mural of the Rani of Jhansi adorns her living room wall and the mention of the leader's name never fails to bring an unexpected rush of tears to her eyes. She browses through dusty volumes of sepia-toned photographs and as she does so, images of a bygone era unfold. An era when patriotism was palpable, awakening the Indian community to new convictions and challenges. Joining of the Rani of Jhansi Regiment Janaki was 18 when one afternoon in July 1943, she stole to the Selangor Padang to hear Subhas Chandra Bose. It was a large gathering of mostly Indians. Plantation workers squatted on the floor in front while the woman stood at a diffident distance. Netaji arrived in an open car with two outriders at the front and spoke in Hindustani, which was largely incomprehensible to this young girl, though she eagerly heard the Tamil interpretation of the speech by Mr. Chidambram, a senior league member. A second-generation migrant to Malaya, Janaki had never seen India and would not visit India till November 2000 when she went to collect the Padma Shri conferred on her by the Indian president. And yet the country came alive in the word pictures so deftly drawn by Bose. Emotionally moved, Janaki raised her feast to the cries of Bharat Mata Ki Jai and went up to the raised platform where Bose and Captain Lakshmi were seated. She was the first woman to respond to the INA's call and next morning's papers carried the news of her donating her personal jewellery to the cause. 
Huge posters lined Ampang Street or Chetty Street as it was then called because of the Chettiers living there of Kuala Lumpur. Other women signed up thereafter. Buddhist Josephine and Christian Stella who came from Rifle Range and would die an early death during the retreat. Anjalai who joined from the Senthul district of Kuala Lumpur. A Hilandam born of a Chinese mother and an Indian father who sent her 10-year-old daughter away to caregivers in Madurai before enlisting as a Rani. Janaki had unwittingly pioneered a trend. The Rani of Jhasi Camp in Singapore Janaki and her sister Papathi moved to the Rani of Jhasi Camp on Waterloo Street in Singapore, much to the dismay of their family. They would spend the next six months here in intensive training, preparing for the onward march to the Indo-Burma border battlefront. Camp life for these girls, brought up in relative luxury in an upper middle class household, was not easy. They lived in atap sheds, slept on narrow wooden planks and had no blanket or pillow till an uncle living in Singapore brought them these little amenities. Breakfast was an unappetizing helping of ragi while the langar commanders dished up something equally unappealing for the other meals of the day. Every afternoon, the girls travelled in open trucks to the Bidadari camp for their military training and would return only in the evening. Yet, despite the obvious discomforts, they did not take long to get accustomed to camp life. At night, they would get together to sing patriotic songs and soon forged new ties of friendship. Under orders of Netaji, no male was allowed entry into their camp. The sentries at the front gate were female and so were the visiting doctors. Female tailors came in the initial days to fit out the girls in their new uniforms. Each camp resident received two sets. One was full length for formal occasions while the other set consisted of shorts and half-sleeved shirts. The uniforms in the beginning were a plain khaki and the INA tricolor bands were added only later. Janaki recalls the initial hesitation of her camp colleagues to wear the uniform and walk the streets of Singapore for their route marches. It was Netaji's words of encouragement which helped them persist despite the jeering crowds at Brass Basar Road. While at Singapore, Janaki and the girls gave a performance at the Cathay Theatre. Janaki played herself, a young girl leaving home to join the nationalist cause. As the girls sang Kadam Kadam Barhaija, march together towards victory and donations for the INA poured in, what mattered most to Janaki was the applause she received from Netaji. Last Days in Singapore Janaki returned to Singapore in August 1945 after the grueling retreat from Burma. She and her group of girls had walked for 26 days under constant enemy fire to reach Molmen and then taken a goods train to Thailand. Netaji had been with them every step of the way, walking at the head of the column. During the last year and a half, they had seen life at its worst in a war-torn Rangoon. The Ranis had nursed the few surviving INA soldiers when the British bombed the army hospital at Mayang. They had travelled in a goods train and taken refuge in leech-infested paddy fields, been bullied by the communist guerrilla and spent nights huddled in wayside schools and villages during the return journey. 
Janaki led her platoon of girls to safety and ensured they reached their homes in different towns in Malaya. By the time she reached Singapore, the Japanese had surrendered and Netaji was preparing to leave on yet another undisclosed journey. Janaki recalls, He gave me a signed copy of his photograph and said, Don't worry Janaki, the British will never get me, dead or alive. That was the last time she saw him. Janaki considers Netaji as one of the greatest leaders till date who worked more than anyone else and to whose call she would not hesitate to respond even today. Well friends, that's the end of this article. But I'm sure that you must be curious to know about the fate of Janaki Dawar and what became of her after the end of the Rani of Chasi Regiment and INA. Friends, I have got another beautiful article on Janaki Dawar written by Sanchari Pal published in The Better India. I will read an excerpt from that article in order to give you a clear view of what happened to her after the end of RJR and INA. So let's start. When INA was disbanded after the British won the war, Janaki joined the Indian Congress Medical Mission in Malaya. Inspired by the work being done by the Indian National Congress, she helped John Thaiwi establish the Malayan Indian Congress in 1946. In 1948, she met Athi Nahappan, then the editor cum publisher of the Malayan Tamil Daily Tamil Lesan, and married him the next year. In the years to come, time and age hardly withered her spirit and determination to serve people. Passionate about social welfare, Janaki began playing an active role in organizations such as the Girl Guide Association and the National Council of Women's Organization. Unsurprisingly, her tireless efforts also saw her being nominated as a senator in the upper house, Devan Negara, of the Malaysian Parliament. Honoured with numerous national and international awards, Janaki also became the first woman of Indian origin outside India to be awarded one of India's highest titles, the Padma Shri. Setting an enduring example of courage and compassion, Janaki Dawar was a woman who walked shoulder to shoulder with the men during trying times. Despite the failure of her dream to help INA defeat the British, she deserves to be remembered and respected for her commitment to the highest of human aspirations, freedom. And that's all for this article too. Unfortunately, this brave personality is with us no more and has left us on 9th May 2014. Lastly, Happy Republic Day to all and on this day, let us all try to give some little tribute to these brave and ever alive legends.